And it looks like we are recording. Welcome everyone to our webinar on optimizing the microbiome for immune health. This is a webinar brought to you by Maryland University of Integrative Health Professional and Continuing Education. And we're so happy that we have so many people interested in joining us to learn about this topic. You are in store for a wealth of information that our feature presenter, Liz Lipsky, is about to share with us. Go ahead and advance the slide, Liz, if you would. So again, we're gonna be talking about optimizing the microbiome for immune health. Go ahead and advance that slide. I am Beth Romansky. I'm the Director of Professional and Continuing Education at Maryland University of Integrative Health, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I'm also an integrative nutrition health coach. So this is a really important topic for, for me as well. And then I'm honored to be with my colleague, Liz Lipsky. We'll have a bio for her shortly, but she is so knowledgeable about the microbiome and digestive health. I'm really excited that she's joined me here today. So a little bit about the professional and continuing education department here at MUIH. We are actually a relatively new division of the university and really excited to be here with you today for our first uh, webinar. And we actually offer a wide variety of professional continuing education courses that are very flexible. Many of them and most of them, all of them right now, of course, are online. And they are designed for health and healthcare practitioners and professionals to gain credentials, CEUs, and really gain skill sets and knowledge that can help them in their practice. But the good thing about this is that we also have a lot of offerings that are really just professional development for the health and wellness enthusiasts who might wanna dip their toe into this world of integrative health. So I'm excited to be here with you because we are trying to grow our community. And so please join our mailing list to stay up to date as we have new offerings being launched all the time. And if you're a new subscriber to our email list, you will get a gift from us for 20% off one of our offerings of your choice. And we do have exclusive discounts for MUH students, alumni, staff and faculty, and our organizational um, partners. And Liz, we're gonna talk about some of these great things next. If you wanna show the next slide, please stay tuned because find us on these websites, but please stay tuned to the end because we're gonna have an opportunity for Q&A for those that are able to join us live, but also some great bonuses for how you can really um, enhance your knowledge on this important topic. So you can find us at muih.edu forward slash CE or email us anytime with your question at ce at muih.edu. And without further ado, we have our featured presenter, Liz Lipsky, my colleague who I'm just so delighted to have here today. Liz is a professor and the director of the academic development for the nutrition programs in clinical nutrition at MUIH. She holds a PhD in clinical nutrition, and she has so many credentials that you can see here, which is why we're so excited to have her taking her time to join us today to share her wealth of knowledge. She is the author of The Art of Digestive Wellness and several other books, and she is the founder of Innovative Healing and the Innovative Healing Academy, which you'll learn about later in this presentation. Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm gonna learn with you and thank you again for being here. Thanks, Beth. I'm, I'm excited to um, be here and be with all of you. And my apologies, I was trying to get on this call for um, over a half an hour until somehow we managed to figure it out. And I'm on Zoom every single day, but somehow this call eluded me. So thanks for being patient. Um, today, what I was asked to speak about by, from Beth is like, how does the microbiome and digestion, why are they even part of immune health? And how does the microbiome play a balance in immune function? Um, and um, to look at kind of overall immune balance and building our immune health, which, which you know, we're all concerned about right now with COVID just skyrocketing. And then um, talk a little bit about kind of the overall picture. 
So I'm gonna start with digestion first and we're gonna kind of move in. And um, as, as Beth said, um, I have a bonus to offer, plus there are other bonuses, I think. So um, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so this is not meant to be, uh, to offer you advice on prevention or treatment of disease. And um, we have to be really careful these days about anything that we make claims for. So everything that I'm presenting is research-based and, um, and it doesn't specifically address COVID even though COVID is on all of our minds. Um, what we're finding out so much is that, is that our overall health um, helps to determine how sick we might get um, from the flu or colds or anything else. And so, um, you know, if you feel like you have a medical issue, please seek medical treatment. And um, this is just an educational uh, webinar for you. So why digestion in the immune system? Well, 70 to 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And you go, well, why would that be? Well, the reason is, is that every single day we eat pounds of food, which our body interprets as foreign material. And um, how the immune system works is that it's really tolerant. I don't know how many of you are parents, but um, as a parent, you learn tolerance. Your child does something, they bother you, they're a little bit uh, wiggy, and if you, kind of reacted every time, pretty soon you'd have a cowering, scared child. And our immune system is a lot like that. So, so what it's always looking for, it's always trying to sense, is this, a, I know this food is a stranger, but is it a dangerous stranger? Because every time we take in this external stuff and put it in our body, we're saying, I want to be just like you. And so when we eat, you know, fast food, our body's getting that message. When we um, sit down and we're upset about something and we binge out on a bag of potato chips or a bag of Oreos or chocolate chip cookies or something, our immune system gets that information. And, and um, so, you know, it's why so much of the immune system is in the gut and pretty much we grew up with food. And so our body doesn't really react a lot to um, real food, but when we start eating processed and restructured foods, our body goes, what is this? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what we, the microbiome is the three to seven pounds of microbes that live on our skin, that live in our lungs, that live in our genitourinary tract, that live in our digestive tract. And most of them, most of this three to seven pounds is in our digestive system. Um, and what we know is that we have as many bacteria in our gut microbiome as we have cells in our body. And these are comprised of both fungi, bacteria, and viruses in the microbiome, and even sometimes parasites. And the number of viruses we have in our microbiome outnumbers the bacteria by 10 to one. So it, it gets kind of unbelievable to me when I start thinking about this. Also, we have about somewhere between 24 and 30,000 um, uh, uh, DNA coding genes. Um, and the microbial genes that we have are 3.3 million and they outnumber our genetic human information by, by 150 to one. So that means that less than 1% of the DNA in your body and my body is actually um, human DNA. The rest is um, these fungi and these bacteria and these viruses, and they are constantly communicating with our DNA and helping it turn on and off. And we have this field called um, epigenetics or and we have another one, nutritional genomics. And what's interesting about these is that they really kind of help regulate metabolism. They, there's always this continual crosstalk 
with our genes and our food and our mood and everything else. Because when I was in school, I got taught my genes were set in stone. And now what we know is that they're not set in stone. Um, for example, I have a grandson who has Down syndrome. And um, my grandson, um, he lives in a rich environment. He's mainstreamed in school. Um, I have great hopes that someday he'll be able to do really good things because he has an environment that's really enriched. And he differs maybe from a child of 100 years ago with Down syndrome, where we didn't really know that nutrition and supplements and um, paying attention and trying to teach would actually help someone. And that's really a severe case. But we know that, that all of our genes can get turned on and off, basically, whether we do meditation or yoga or, or um, eat lots of vegetables, um, use herbs and spices, all these things help regulate not only our microbiome, but our gene expression. Um, so we can think of our DNA, if you've done DNA testing on yourself, as kind of the code, but the software is the way that we live our lives. And the code is the hardware like your computer. Um, so anyway, the microbiome is really important. And I like to think of the digestive system like this picture I took of the Columbia River near my house outside of Portland, Oregon. And, and you know, when everything is fine, the, dig the river runs through us. And the reason that we eat is to nourish every single cell in our body. And so we need this river kind of running through doing what it's supposed to do. But sometimes like a river, um, we can have a drought. Um, maybe people aren't able to get food. They have food insecurity and um, their river dries up and the cells and the land are not nourished very well. And, and other times we have flooding of this river like leaky gut. And what happens is that the whole river, we get garbage flowing through our bloodstream and then we start getting immune reactions from it like food sensitivities and autoimmune conditions, which I'll talk about in a minute. So digestion really is the river of life and we want it flowing through well and easily. We want digestion and absorption and um, everything to work easily. So when we think about food, food is information and there's a lot of colorful food on this slide. And, um, but we know that if we eat the food that's on the right side, I almost hesitate to call it food, the food-like substance that's on the right side of this screen, that we feel differently than the, when we eat the food that's on the left side of the screen. And there may be moments in your life where you go, I just wanna, I just want a gummy worm because it reminds me of being with my grandmother and it makes me feel really happy and good and that's okay. But what we know is that the, that the average American person is eating almost 72% of their food every day as ultra processed food. So when we look at this, um, this is a, a diagram by Miles to kind of show what happens when we eat certain foods and what happens with gut inflammation and dysbiosis, which I'll explain more, but dysbiosis is an imbalance of your gut microbiome or your skin microbiome or your lung microbiome. And what we know is that eating foods like at the top of the screen, like salmon, um, is actually really great for you. These toll-like receptors, um, especially in the gut, we have toll-like receptor four, kind of are, are that, is this a dangerous stranger? Or is this a good stranger? And we know salmon is a good stranger. And so it kind of dampens down that TLR effect because when that gets really activated, what happens is that we end up with, with um, uh, food sensitivities and immune reactions. But what we can see is that when we eat saturated fats, and again, the research was not done on, on uh, extra virgin coconut oil or the, the cattle that you got that your neighbor raised or that you raised or the eggs from your own 
um, backyard. This was just done on what most people eat. What we see is that saturated fats activate inflammation throughout the gut and contribute to imbalanced microbiome, which is dysbiosis. We know that genetically we have one really good paper, but at least saccharin in about half of the people um, stimulates dysbiosis. Um, sugar definitely does. And the average person's eating when you add high fructose corn syrup and table sugar together, about a hundred pounds a year. So I'm not getting mine and you're probably not getting all of yours. So somebody's getting a lot more. Um, red meats, um, phytonutrients, all of our plant foods seem to have put a break on all of this. Um, and the gut inflammation leads to what we call leaky gut syndrome or increased intestinal permeability, which um, increases our risk to autoimmune conditions and also food sensitivities, environmental sensitivities, sensitivities, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and more. So we can have inflammation anywhere through our digestive system. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, from our tongue, which you might've noticed some inflammation on your tongue from at some point, even one of those little bumps on your tongue, um, sometimes that we get and you go, wow, that really hurts all the way down through our digestive tract, we can be inflamed. And again, the microbiome is a balance of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And what we know the most about right now is the bacteria. Um, one of my doctoral students, uh, Jessica Tichnell, is now working on a paper on the mycobiome, which is the fungi, and the virome is just being discovered as well. And these microbiotic can be beneficial, like the ones that we find in <coughs> cultured and fermented foods or probiotics. They can be commensals, which means that they help run metabolism, but we might not really know exactly what their specific benefit is. And then we can have pathogens. And mostly what we've heard about most of our life is all the pathogens, like bacteria bad, viruses bad, fungi bad. But, um, but most of these are actually good for us. And it's this interplay between the beneficial and commensal microbes and the balance of them with the pathogens and our lifestyles that keeps us in balance. So where are these microbes? Um, they're almost all in your colon, your large intestine. There's some in your small intestine. We have some E. coli and some lactobacillus and some streptococcus. Ew, doesn't that sound like we're gonna get strep throat? Yeah, it does, except that they're a really beneficial strep. In fact, every time you eat a yogurt, you're getting some. And then, um, but most of them really live in the colon. And so um, this is where the focus is. And when we do kind of uh, stool testing, we start looking at some of the newer labs. We can kind of look at, at many of these microbes and see, are they in balance? Are they out of balance? We talk about the human microbiome, but what I want to show you is that we have microbiomes on every different surface. So if you look at this and you look at the mouse saliva and you can see, just compare it to the chart of, of your gums, the mouth gingiva or your mouth tongue, you can see that the colors, um, although they're the same, that the percentage of different kinds of microbes that you have on them is different. And we know from research that that every tissue of the microbiome in your, bo in your body, sorry, um, I'm really feeling that we started late. So I'm kind of tripping over my words a little bit here. Um, anyway, every tissue in your body and every surface of your body has a different microbiome. And, um, and we know from research that even my left hand and my right hand only have about 70% the same microbiome. And the reason is that I do different things with my left and right hand all the time. And so when we look at that, um, the gut microbiome plays the biggest role because it's the biggest microbiome, but changes in the skin microbiome cause things like eczema and psoriasis and things in changes in the mouth gingival 
microbiome in the saliva can cause periodontal disease. And so all of our microbiomes are important. What influences the microbiome? Well, how we were born. Were we born vaginally or by C-section? Were we breastfed or bottle fed? Um, did we have pets or did we live around farm animals when we were little kids? We know that the babies who live on farms or children who have dogs especially, they co-mingle their microbiome and they get a more robust and diverse microbiome. Um, if you have siblings also, you're gonna get exposed to everything they get exposed to. It makes it more diverse. Diversity is one of MUIH's key principles, but diversity also makes us more resilient. And um, age, we know that um, until you're about like three or four, um, your microbiome is still developing. So things like taking antibiotics as an infant or a small child can really kind of knock your microbiome back. And we also know that as we age, the microbiome gets less diverse and less robust. Um, um, where you're from in the world, where you live, um, if you came from um, um, Romania and you eat Romanian foods, even if you live in the US, you're gonna have a microbiome that, that is kind of a cross between a US and a Romanian microbiome, or if you uh, originally came from uh, India, you will have, and you eat a lot of your traditional Indian diet, you're gonna again have, have a microbiome that's a mix of American microbes and, and, um, and Indian microbes. Um, your genetics and also your overall health status. Again, you know, as we get more sick, our microbiome um, gets less robust and diverse. So a lot of that we can't change that much, but what's modifiable is how we eat, um, paying attention to our circadian rhythms, getting enough sleep, um, uh, waking up in the morning instead of waking up at noon. Um, in my course, I kind of have a whole lecture on circadian rhythm. Um, the timing of meals and time-restricted eating. We know that um, the gut microbiome has its own circadian rhythm. So when we give it a break, it has time to kind of regroup and to um, renew itself. Um, stress, movement, chemical exposures, antibiotics, other drugs, um, prednisones, uh, immunosuppressants, um, birth control pills, all of these things can influence our microbiome. Um, so dysbiosis is that imbalanced microbiome, and that can um, express itself as a bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, or parasites. And um, so probably some of you have had um, a bladder infection. Well, a bladder infection is dysbiosis of your bladder. Um, some of you may have had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or a vaginal yeast infection or athlete's foot. Athlete's foot is a fungal overgrowth of your toes. Um, or you may have had parasites. And these imbalances um, make us feel sick. So um, this is a, a chart out of my book, Digestive Wellness, that I was allowed to utilize and kind of modify a little bit. But um, from a, a group at Nestle in Switzerland, um, but, but basically what we know is that when we eat prebiotic rich foods and probiotic rich foods or take prebiotic or probiotic supplements, that it helps to balance this immune system and the microbiome. But when we don't have those prebiotics and probiotics, what happens is we get out of balance and we can have more um, inflammation. So, so um, just something to think about and prebiotic foods are, are the soluble fibers in our foods, the fibers in our foods, the colors in our foods. Um, essential fatty acids have some prebiotic properties. And so when we look at the gut, if we look at the left side of this chart, um, you can see a healthy microbiome and in a healthy microbiome, we have low gut permeability. That's no leaky gut. We have low amounts of um, toxins going into the bloodstream or low amounts of um, 
food molecules that are partially digested or pesticides that came in on those foods or molds that came in on those foods or fungi, those don't get into our body. And we have low amounts of what's called um, bacterial lipopolysaccharides. We don't have a lot less inflammation and we have um, short chain fatty acids, which are the messenger molecules that keep the, the um, colon working absolutely well and also reach out systemically into our body and keep everything else regulated. And we have more insulin sensitivity. But on the right side, you can see that all the opposite is true. And that leads to metabolic diseases like type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune diseases, cancers, and more. And what we know is that diet, a high fat, high sugar diet, stress and antibiotics make our dysbiosis lean to the right. But when we eat in a healthy way, we lean to the left. And so that's why we're starting to see research on why lifestyle um, really helps prevent flus. And um, we're just starting to see new research that indicates that it may help um, modulate COVID as well. So um, altered microbiome and disease, we have all these different kinds of health issues that we know that are related to this, including chronic kidney disease, autism, um, cardiovascular disease, which is a whole different lecture, um, whether we're happy or depressed or anxious, all of this lies in this microbiome. Um, so here's some uh, more references from the previous slide. And then cancer in the microbiome, is it a cause or effect or both? And I would say it's a both, okay? Because when our gut microbiome is healthy and our virome is healthy, we are protective and they suppress um, uh, tumor development. But um, what we know is that when um, we have dysbiosis, it opens us more up to developing cancers, but also chemo and radiation and some of the new biologics that we're using for people for cancer, they disrupt the gut microbiome, they increase leaky gut. And so we are always wanting to try to gently protect people who have cancers um, and who are going through treatment by supporting them nutritionally so that we can um, help to uh, keep them as well as possible. And again, that's a whole different lecture. Um, and the lung microbiome, I wanted to put something in because we know that COVID-19 really affects lungs. Um, it's one of the main target tissues and we don't have any research yet on COVID-19 and the lung microbiota, but you can see that um, the microbiome in people who are healthy versus people with asthma or cystic fibrosis, there, there's overlap because it's a Zen diagram, but you can see that otherwise these are very different. And what I, I want to also point out is that in the healthy microbiome in the lungs, we have um, Clostridia uh, cladosporides, which is a microbe I've never even heard of, right? And so do we have probiotics that have these four microbes in them? Not yet, but be aware because eventually we probably will. Lung specific probiotic. Um, I did, and I was able to purchase this, um, this uh, diagram to show you, we have um, a possible role of the gut microbiome in modulating immune response in COVID-19. And this is the first paper that I've been able to find on kind of the gut microbiome and COVID. But what you're gonna see is, wow, we got the same immune homeostasis in the middle, which is that same kind of uh, seesaw teeter-totter that I showed you in one of the other slides about dysbiosis and, and the gut microbiome. And so we wanna see a balance of the gut microbiota because what we know is that when it's in balance, we have a lot of anti-inflammatory responses. T regulatory cells are what I consider to be the brakes of the immune system. And our pro-inflammatory responses, Th7, which is uh, responsible for autoimmune disease, 
IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha. These are the immune responses that are pro-inflammatory down on the right side. And what we know is, you know, you sprain your ankle, it swells up. That is an immune response. It's bringing in all kinds of uh, emergency EMTs, um, you know, all kinds of uh, protective things to help with that healing. And we want that to happen. But what, and then the T regulatory cells are kind of the brakes and they go, hey guys, the ankle is really healing up well. Time to like go back to the firehouse and wait until there's another call. But what happens is that in most Americans, we're inflamed all the time because the food that we eat is inflammatory. And the stressors that we have and our lack of exercise and sleep tip us over the edge. So causes of dysbiosis, diet, leaky gut, medications such as acid blockers, antibiotics, et cetera, environmental toxins, alcohol. And I know most people love to drink, but um, too much alcohol can really damage your gut lining and contribute to all of this. Excessive stress, um, which I think plays a role these days, and overgrowth of yeast and bacteria. Um, so those are some of them. And you know, we wanna really start thinking these days about like, how do we build our immune resilience? It's not about like tipping it one way or the other. It's about how do we stay centered in our immunity? And all that starts in the roots of the tree. The functional medicine tree is on the left of this slide. And basically you can see the roots of the tree are sleep and relaxation and exercise and movement and nutrition and stress um, modification and um, relationships. And so we start looking at that. Well, I hate to say it, but our response to COVID, because it's so um, emergence, emergent and it came on us out of nowhere, we've been focusing on the roots, uh, not on the roots of this, of like our immune resilience, but we've been focusing on, oh my gosh, we've got people who are really sick. What medications, what vaccines, how can we like modulate this in an emergency situation? What we haven't heard a lot about is, wait a minute, if we pay attention to the roots of this tree first, maybe people won't get as sick. If we pay attention to the roots of the tree, when somebody gets sick, maybe it won't be as severe. And we're starting to see this. I'm, I'm sad to say, I'm really sad to say, but but, um, you know, and I totally understand it, but one of the issues in, in kind of our COVID response is that the government does not want people making crazy claims about eat this, you know, marshmallow, eat 10 marshmallows a day and you'll be resistant to COVID. And we've seen all kinds of crazy rumors going on. And so until we have research, um, we really don't want to, nobody can really say much, but what we're starting to see is that when vitamin D levels are better, people are better protected. When zinc is better, people are prote better protected. When people are healthier to begin with, people are better protected. And, and so, you know, it's really important that you pay attention to the basics. Did you get a minimum of seven to nine hours of sleep every night? Are you moving? Are you moving your body? Less than a quarter of Americans get regular exercise. Are you eating real food almost all the time? How are you dealing with stress? We're all under stress. Here in Oregon, we're pretty much on lockdown again. Um, 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 maybe you are too. What about healthy relationships? And where do you find meaning and purpose in your life? You know, do you have um, a relationship with God that gets you up and out of bed in the morning? Do you have a relationship with your work or with your colleagues or what gets you out of bed in the morning and makes you excited to be alive? All of these things are the roots of our trees and so important. So how do we modulate the microbiome with food? This is just a picture I took at, um, the market up in Seattle. Um, and what we know is the diet has the most powerful influence on the gut microbiome in healthy human subjects. 
and 75% of food in the Western diet is of limited or no benefit to the microbiome. Okay, and that's all that ultra processed food that most of us are eating and the alcohol we're drinking. Um, so I love this paper by David et al. And um, what, what David et al um, did was they took nine people and they said, you know what, we're gonna take everybody, we're gonna start you on just your regular diet, and then we're gonna um, switch, put you on um, two extreme diets. So they put them on a heavy plant-based diet, which was grains, vegetables, and legumes um, for five days. And then they switched to um, an animal-based diet, which has all uh, kind of meat, egg, and cheese. And what I wanna show you about this chart on the right side is that um, you can see person A, when they started to, to um, the, you can see they started and then their diet immediately within 24 hours, their um, levels of something shot way up, their microbiome really changed. And then when they stopped eating that heavy plant-based diet, it went back down to baseline. And then, um, then they did the animal-based diet ten, the, 10 days later and their microbes went down. But if you look at person B, the opposite happened. And with person C, the same thing happened as with person B. And then with P person D and E, um, you can see like D, pretty much nothing happened with changes in that person's diet. And person E, Nothing happened on the plant-based diet, but when they went on the meat-based diet, something really changed. So what this tells you is a bunch of things. One, you can change your gut microbiome from almost all of us in one or in, within one day, within 24 hours, and this has been shown over and over, but it's the sustained change in what we eat that makes a sustained change in our gut microbiome. The other thing that you can see from this is that everybody's different. And so there isn't one right diet for everybody. Um, and then we also see, this is another um, paper that basically says the more fruits and vegetables and fiber we eat, the more bacterial richness and diversity we have in our microbiome. So this finding supports a recently reported link between long-term diet habits and the microbiome, okay? And so, I'm missing a sentence there. So I got this chart just a, a week or so ago from Gut Microbiota for Health, and it kind of encapsulates everything that I've just said in a nice little uh, pictograph, infographic. And so how do you eat your way to a diverse microbiota? Dietary fibers that, um, can eat, be eaten by the gut microbes, which are our prebiotic rich foods, add probiotics um, and probiotic rich foods, all of our cultured and fermented vegetables, choose a balanced amount of animal and plant-based proteins, um, include foods rich in omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So our omega-6 are things like nuts and seeds. Um, and our omega-3s are that salmon we talked about before and eat plenty of vitamins and minerals. It doesn't say take plenty of vitamins and minerals. It says eat plenty of vitamins and minerals. Um, so when I look at kind of these prebiotics, what, what one of the reasons why we eat them is that they make these things called short chain fatty acids. So let's say this morning in my smoothie, I put some um, green powders and red powders and some kale and some blueberries and some ginger and some turmeric and some uh, protein powder and some other things, cinnamon. And basically it was loaded with prebiotics. And these prebiotics are not metabolically active until they get gobbled up by the microbes in our colon. And when they do, they produce these things called short chain fatty acids. And butyric acid or butyrate is the main fuel. It's like it's the AT, it produces the ATP, 70% of the energy for our colon cells. And um, it also is um, gene modulating and does all these other things. And so it's the main short chain fatty acid that fuels our microbiome, feeds us and keeps our colon healthy. But propionate 
moves and gets taken up by the litter, uh, by the liver. And it has to do with like how well our liver and gallbladder work. And it has anti-immune and, and effects throughout the body. Um, and it promotes satiety. And acetate, which is another short chain fatty acid, moves through all of our body tissues, especially our muscles and our brain. And again, helps work with our liver and gallbladder, helps with mineral absorption, um, and helps keep pathogens at bay. So eating these prebiotic rich foods um, feeds our microbiome and that creates these short chain fatty acids that then keep us healthy um, systemically. So how do we enhance these short chain fatty acids? We eat more prebiotic rich foods. We balance the gut microbes by eating fermented and cultured foods. We may even take probiotic supplements and you can test for short chain fatty acids by doing either some kind of a functional medicine test on stool or doing organic acid testing, which is a urine test. So dietary fibers strongly um, contribute to the health of the microbiome and these short chain fatty acids. Um, and what we know is that most, uh, most people in our culture eat half as many fibers as they should eat every day. Um, I think every day I get about 40 grams of fiber. And um, you, know, you wanna shoot for a minimum of 25 to 40 grams of fiber every day in your diet. The benefits of fiber, and um, you'll have this as a handout, I'm sure, but um, um, these handouts are things I created for my course. It kind of shows you kind of what's common about, ins about insoluble fiber, like um, uh, uh, wheat fiber, right? Wheat, um, wheat bran, um, which is different from oat bran, which is more soluble. And the soluble fibers are all prebiotics and resistant starches are also prebiotics, except that we haven't um, done enough research to put labels on all of them. And so that's why I have them still kind of separated out, but you can see like, it, it's so important that we get enough fiber in our diet because it regulates blood sugar. It keeps us feeling full so that we don't need to eat all the time. It lowers cancer risk, um, may prevent hemorrhoids and reduce the risk of diverticulosis, um, binds bile acids, reduces inflammation, and helps build bone. Um, um, so all of this is so important. And this is a chart that I made on um, probiotic benefits. And the main thing that you need to know though about probiotics is what's on the upper right. They modulate the immune system and inflammation. They reduce it. And how they do that is in a multitude of ways. But one of those ways is that they enhance those T regulatory cells, which are the breaks of the immune system and says, all is well. Um, they also help us detox heavy metals and chemicals. And um, this slide did not format that well, but anyway, you can get the gist. So fermented foods, I think most of you probably know what these look like. And um, these fermented foods have both probiotics and um, beneficial microbes that may or may not yet have been studied as prebiotics, but have the same benefits. And then common probiotic supplements, your lactobacilli, your bifidobacterium, your stress species, Saccharomyces boulardii, um, which is um, a cousin to bread yeast, um, um, baker's yeast. And then we've also got a bacilli species, which are the soil-based microorganisms for probiotics. So how do we reduce systemic inflammation? Well, a Mediterranean or elimination diet of some sort, those of you who have gone through um, the nutrition programs at MUIH know about Elimination diets, um, Mediterranean diet is anti-inflammatory. We have so much research on it. And I would also say any traditional diet. Um, so um, anti-inflammatory medical foods, um, things like curcumin, ginger, and boswellia. Remember I told you I put 
a hunk of fresh turmeric and a hunk of fresh ginger into my smoothie every morning. Um, fish oil, colostrum, probiotics, all of these things help reduce inflammation. So how do we balance our stress response? Well, one of the interesting things is that the gut and the brain are connected by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is called the wanderer because it starts by modulating the pupils in our eyes and goes all the way down to regulate bladder function, like when, it's time, when we feel it's time to urinate. And um, what we know is that, is that um, the vagus nerve dysfunction is associated with a lot of different kind of conditions. And I, I kind of bolded immune system function because that's what we're focusing on today, but really has uh, plays a role in whether we're fat or thin and cardiovascular health, um, cognitive function, and so much else. Um, and so how do we enhance the vagus nerve is pretty much we chill, okay? So probiotics can be helpful, but meditation, acupuncture, singing, chanting, playing a musical instrument, listening to music, um, relaxation, you know, laying down and reading a good novel. Um, all of these things really help. Um, Dr. Detis Karazian and why his brain, why isn't my brain working? He says, you can gargle. He says, gargle in the shower with shower water, you know, and um, sing loudly. Um, gagging is not my favorite way to do this, but it works. Coffee enemas, again, I don't think are maybe the best way to do this, but, but you know, think about how you actually relax. So simple ways to unwind. So I kind of, um, put a bunch of things down here um, and brainstorm with my friend, um, Paula Bartholomew from Hawthorne University. Um, she has some really soft music she likes to listen to, but abdominal breathing, prayer, meditation, spending time in nature, exercise, call a friend, listen to music, play an instrument, read or listen to books on tape, um, play a game with others, solve a puzzle, plant a garden, and savor the moment. Um, when I go on my walks, I, I usually take my phone with me so that I can take pictures of the miracles that are around me everywhere, um, which there are miracles to be seen every single day, even if you take the same walk. The change of the seasons, the way that right now the wind is blowing the leaves down from the trees, savor the moments, take them in because when we do that, changes this bagel nerve tone and um, makes the gut and the brain work great. And again, that's a whole lecture on gut brain. So um, here's also some websites and guided meditations and things that are good resources for you to enhance your resilience to stress. And then also we have apps like Calm, Headspace, Stop, Breathe and Think, Brain FM, um, Happify, and heart map, all of these, if you work better with an app, um, are really great things that you can do. So I hope that what I've been able to kind of tell you about is that the gut and the brain are really connected to each other, that our immune resilience and adaptability is tied to our lifestyle and also our digestive system. I hope I've given you a opening an introduction to the gut microbiome so that you understand how important it is. I hope I've shown you that food and exercise and the way that we live in our lifestyle is critically important to modulating the microbiome and that having a healthy microbiome is actually the key to really great overall health. Um, so I want to just, um, uh, in, uh, in, encourage you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this presentation that you've given us. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that since we started a few minutes late, we are going to continue the webinar and this will be recorded so that you can view it later. I just wanted to let you all know that if you do have to hop off, you will re receive the recording of this, but we're going to continue on to tell you more about how you can learn about these topics and if there is time permitting afterwards to address a couple of very specific questions that we got during the presentation. But 
Liz, you really just, you know, you, I think really from my perspective, we know as, as health and wellness practitioners, there's a lot of things that um, incorporate, uh, you can incorporate into your daily life that don't take a lot of effort or even, you know, money. Like you said something about when you take a walk, how you can take pictures of things that make you feel more um, balanced. And I, just, I love that. It's just trying to find easy ways that you can incorporate this into your life. And if you are a health or healthcare practitioner, you want to try to meet clients um, and patients where they are. I know that it's not easy for all of us, especially during this time. And there's going to be better days than others. But really just thinking about the long term and, and what you're doing most of the time, I think, is what we're trying to convey today. And I love, Liz, how you just bring a real balanced approach and a holistic approach to this topic. So we actually have some really interesting courses. I know there's a lot of in-depth questions that you might have based upon the things that Liz has shared today. In the professional and continuing education department, Liz has actually uh, worked with us to develop a very comprehensive series on balancing the microbiome. It's a masterclass package. So it's a lot of what you've heard today in terms of the presentation style, but it really goes in depth into the four class areas. Each of those topics are individual courses and it's all online, completely self-paced and flexible. And you will have lifetime access to that content to review, and use the handouts and the materials, not just for yourself, but for your clients and patients if you are in the integrative health field. You can enroll in each course individually, or you can enroll in the package. And we actually have a great discount for those of you that are watching this webinar and that signed up because we have a lot of attendees and registrants. So for the community that's joining us today, we are offering 30% off with that promotional code through November 20th. So it's a couple of days from now that we're offering this for your joining us today if you purchase the masterclass package. And you can learn more about it at the Professional and Continuing Education website at muih.edu forward slash CE, or you can actually go right to that program and peruse and email CE at muih.edu with any questions. But we really, Hope that that would be a valuable continuation of what you've learned today. And then Liz, we've actually partnered with her and her organization, her Innovative Healing Academy. We're um, really excited to partner with you, Liz, um, because you actually have an amazing course as well that covers a little bit different topics in the Balance in the Masterclass series. I've actually taken this program. And as a person who has digestive um, issues myself and really got me into this field of integrative health and trying to really solve some of the problems that conventional medicine wasn't able to solve in a holistic matter, uh, manner, should I say, I really enjoyed this course, both from the individual and from the practitioner standpoint. It covers so much, not just in terms of the microbiome, um, but also you get cooking videos and recipes and research and, you know, it covers SIBO and just all of these really innovative things. And I know that, Liz, you might want to talk a little bit about this program, but we also have for everybody here today, a free digestive health questionnaire, which I really encourage you guys to download, even if you don't enroll in the program. Um, but Liz, would you like to say anything about your Innovative Healing Academy Art of Digestive Wellness course that I didn't already cover? Um, you covered it really well. I do hope that you'll all download the, the questionnaire. It breaks down um, digestion into 15 different categories and it helps people kind of pinpoint, could this be leaking gut? Could this be undiagnosed celiac disease or gluten intolerance? Could this be that I need more enzymes? Could I have um, dysbiosis? Could that be yeast or fungal um, or bacterial? Um, and it gives you kind of a, a ways to go to start thinking about, about that. So if you're a clinician and you give that to one of your patients or clients, it helps you to figure out, aha, here's a, some tips and clues. And if you're a person, you can um, either, you know, figure it out on your own by reading or reading my book or whatever. Um, but, but you can also 
um, take it into your doctor and say, look, I filled out this questionnaire and I'm wondering if you could check my gallbladder or my liver because it says I'm having some issues here or whatever. So I hope you'll download the questionnaire. And then also, you know, what I wanted to do with this was, was really, I'm kind of towards the end of my career. And so in this course, I really poured out a lot of what I know and wanted to share wisdom that I felt like I couldn't all put in the book and, uh, and also really give my insight. So that's really what the course is about. And I just kind of overblown it with just content. Um, you'll have access to it for a minimum of two years if you sign up, it's self-paced. And um, also, if again, if you enroll by November 20th into this course, um, we'll send you um, a Kindle version of, of the, my new book, the fifth edition of my book, Digestive Wellness. So um, I know yeah, it's- thank, a, you. I, yeah, thank you so much, Liz, for that. I, I really, you know, if you haven't read her books, I think they're also just a wonderful resource that you want to keep on your, on your shelf or your Kindle to refer back to because our life, it changes and you can always- be learning and tweaking and tinkering, like you like to say, Liz. And that's what I really like about these uh, resources is that they're very convenient and flexible, but also they're evidence-based. And, you know, we're always learning something new, but I think if you start with these foundations, you have a really great place to begin. Um, so we have some bonuses. And again, I appreciate everybody's um, participation that if you would um, enroll through the PCE link, that really helps us to, uh, partner with other uh, subject matter experts and organizations because we do get a referral um, incentive for that because we we want to support people that we really respect and, and want to collaborate with. So that's why we ask you um, to enroll through our link, but it's optional. I just want to add that as a disclaimer as well. But so November 20th, I hope that you're all interested in learning something new. You can have access to it and you don't have to start the programs until after the new year if you're really busy with the holidays. So um, again, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. We will, if you are interested in taking a little bit more time, we have maybe just a few more minutes we can go over. I would like to just um, go to the next slide and see if you have any questions about the courses or we can actually um, answer some of the uh, questions in the chat. And just so you know, you will receive this recording. I'm getting a lot of questions about that. So everybody will receive the recording. You will all also receive an email with those links. So you'll have direct links to enroll in the courses that we mentioned. And we will try to also um, discuss sharing the PDF slides with you as a bonus as well. So you can visit us at Maryland University of Integrative Health at that website. But I just wanna say, um, I see some questions here and just some thank yous. And I know that some of you are educators here. I'm not sure if we have just general health and wellness enthusiasts or practitioners, but I think we might have a mix. So I'm so glad that we gave something for everybody. Liz, do you wanna answer maybe one or two questions just to see um, you know, if we have a little bit of time for those that were chatting in? I am all yours. Awesome, well, while we have you, we had some interesting questions um, from some of our practitioners. Lori Ellington, actually Lori is one of my colleagues at MUIH too. She actually developed a wonderful course um, around resilience and she's a heart math um, expert. So I encourage you to take a look at our our course developed by Lori, but she asked, um, she's interested in probiotic recommendations, um, fermented foods for people with histamine intolerance. And I know that I've learned a lot about that myself too. Um, just wondering in your thoughts on what you um, think about histamine intolerance and using fermented and probiotic foods in that situation. If someone has histamine intolerance, um, fermented and cultured foods are off the table. Um, because they actually promote um, histamine response. So there are a couple things that some people may tolerate, but most people, especially fermented vegetables, things like kimchi and sauerkraut, they're, and wine, beer, they're pretty much no-nos for anybody who has histamine intolerance. Um, 
there is a probiotic that I think would work really well. And it's, um, it's uh, Lactobacillus plantarum. And it is one of the main um, microbes that you find in sauerkraut or kimchi, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but the product that I would recommend, and I have nothing to do with this company, is called Transformation Enzymes. And they make a product called Plantidophilus. And it's a very, very low dose of Lactobacillus plantarum, which is a very soothing probiotic. Um, so I might try just one a day of those and see how it goes. Um, the other thing that we found is like low histamine diets work really well, but also a low FODMAP diet reduces urinary histamines eightfold. And so um, even trying a low FODMAP diet might be something that would be useful for people who have uh, histamine reactions. Thank you, Liz. I know that for me, the low FODMAP diet really helped a lot. And, um, you know, just really about customizing your personal nutrition protocol. It's, it's not one size fits all, which you said before. And I think that's what's really um, fun and interesting about, you know, the course that you have, the, the book that you have. It really supports people in all of those scenarios and to try to not just take one recommendation because they read it somewhere. Um, great. So the other question is from Lynn Lee, and um, we have that uh, question is, I've recently been reading about kombucha and that it isn't always um, reliably lacto-fermented. Can you speak to this and should we be recommending it as a fermented option to clients? Interesting. So we do have some, uh, some good research on kombucha and for many people, kombucha is an amazing uh, fermented food for them to drink. It does have a little bit of alcohol, teeny tiny amounts. So for somebody who has uh, issues with alcohol intolerance or uh, alcohol substance abuse, it's not recommended. Um, but, you know, it, again, it's a food. So, for example, I know a man who's got type 1 diabetes. And what he finds is that when he drinks kombucha a couple of cups a day, that his need for insulin goes way down. There are people who I've known who have IBS or fatigue or um, constipation or other health issues, and they find that drinking kombucha really helps um, their overall sense of well being and their health. That said, it's a food. And if it makes you feel good, drink it. If it doesn't, don't. So for me, I used to make kombucha all the time. And I'm, my husband doesn't drink it because he does have histamine issues. And um, he's a highly allergic person. Um, so it's not a good food for him. And what I found was my kombucha tummy got full. Like the benefits that I was getting from the kombucha, my body finally said, you know what, I think I've had enough of this. And so like any food, I'll eat it, season, I'll, I'll make it seasonally or what, if I'm feeling like some, I'll make a batch or I'll buy a bottle. Um, I do think that uh, most of it is, uh, you know, a pretty good quality, whether you make it at home or whether you buy it. Um, I don't, I haven't read anything about whether it's reliably lacto-fermented or not. But if it has those kind of little bubbles in it when it's first made, um, then it is. Uh, or if when you open up a, 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 a bottle of it that you bought, it should have a little bit of effervescence, which tells you that it has been um, reliably fermented. And so it's kind of like, and, and how much of it, it's like if you ask me, well, how many blueberries should I eat? It's like, well, how many blueberries do you like? So if you like kombucha, drink it. If you don't, don't. Um, what I find is that for the last year or so, I've been hooked on kimchi and I have like a third of a cup of kimchi every morning with breakfast. So, you know, everybody um, kind of find a fermented food that works for you. And if you have histamine problems, keep them off the table and don't eat them until you're feeling much better. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because we all we all have different uh, preferences and then changes with the seasons. And I even noticed with kombucha that different brands taste differently. When I made it myself, I would 
pretty much, you know, have it sitting there. So it would just, uh, I guess, all the sugar <laughs> would be gone because I'd like it more vinegary, you know? So I think that there's a lot of differences um, in that, but you don't have to force somebody to drink kombucha if it doesn't suit them. So I don't see any other questions in the chat, but I see some really wonderful comments. And Liz, I think that you just shared so much and once again, you're so generous with your knowledge. And that's why I hope that you'll consider looking at either one of our courses and programs that we shared with you today and getting in with the bonuses and the discounts that we have for you and at least downloading Liz's digestive health questionnaire and to stay in touch with us because we're here to build up this wonderful community who's interested in integrative health and wellness. And like Liz, you said about, we need to be talking about the foundations, the roots, and you know, together we can all, we can all strengthen our roots together, I think. So share this webinar with somebody that you think would benefit from it if you um, weren't able to join us live. We're so happy that you're viewing this later. And again, Liz, my sincere gratitude for your generosity and sharing all this wonderful information once again and your expertise. So I'm just delighted to work with you. Thanks, Beth. It was a pleasure. And congratulations. This is the first official PC <laughs> webinar. Yay! Yay! Hopefully you will all see more of us. So I'll stop the recording now, but thank you all. Be well, stay safe. And just, you know, stay in touch with us because we're all here for each other and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon.